All right. So uh, I'm going to be talking here a little bit about uh, private, uh, public and private cloud management, specifically the tools that, uh, that, that we have built at Scalar and, and that the community has built that would allow you to manage uh, workloads, whether they're running on the public cloud, on the private cloud, uh, a combination thereof, or um, and, and talking about some of the challenges uh, that you'll, you'll face when running these types of workloads. Uh, so first of all, a little bit about Scalar itself. Um, we've, uh, as an open source project, um, we also have a hosted product, and that hosted product alone has launched more than 800,000 servers. Uh, if you add to that the, the uh, open source community, that's over 8 million servers that have been launched. Uh, this spans uh, over 7,000 companies uh, for a project that was created in April 2008, so it's been a little over four years now. Uh, the, the license uh, for Scalar is the Apache 2 license, same as CloudStack. So when you're, uh, when, you're managed, when you're deploying your, your own cloud, you might want to consider having, um, using the same uh, a cloud management tool that has the same license and same terms as, um, as your private cloud. So uh, cloud management in a nutshell. First of all, something that people don't really realize that much is that uh, cloud management is a layer on top of public and private cloud infrastructure. It's really an abstraction layer for cloud resources that lets you operate in the concepts that you care about. For example, um, you don't really care that much about the servers and IP addresses that much. What you care about is applications and the services uh, that m make up components of that application. So cloud management tools allow you to operate at a higher level. It's an abstraction layer that allows you to, to operate at that higher level. It allows, let, lets you focus a lot more on the strategy than on the tactics, tactics by doing that. So concretely, what a cloud management tool uh, brings you uh, is the automation, uh, is both automation and management tools so that you don't have to uh, worry that much about capacity provisioning. You worry about your strategy for provisioning new or deprovisioning uh, capacity based on any metrics that you want. Um, it's also automation around database replication, around building systems and not ma managing individual servers. So again, it go goes back to this idea of managing, um, managing systems and not servers, managing uh, think, uh, resources at a much higher level. So all of this is in support for one thing, which is basically blocking our operations, making sure that, that as you move to the cloud, you go from one sysadmin for every 20 servers on average to one sysadmin for 1,000 or even 10,000 servers. Um, so bringing a lot more agility, a lot more efficiency into your IT operations. Now, cloud management is actually very, very big. Um, Five years ago, uh, the, the term was relatively new, but right now there's 10 times more queries about what cloud management is uh, than five years ago. So you can see here the graph of is, is for the, uh, is for the is using Google Insights to see uh, how cloud management has progressed in search volume. Um, that equates about to one query every minute on google.com, which is huge compared to five years ago. So, when you're operating in, in the cloud, um, your infrastructure is go you're going to end up doing things uh, in a very repeated manner. For example, um, provisioning a server might be very easy, uh, but there's a, uh, there's a very big difference between provisioning a single server and provisioning 10 servers if you're doing everything manually. Uh, if you're doing everything manually, then you're spending a lot of time on routine, undifferentiated tasks, and that's very error prone. Whenever it, it's it's kind of like when you're when you're doing something manually. After a while, uh, after a while, you, your mind just kind of shifts to something else, and that increases the likelihood that you start making mistakes. Um, IT departments are typically understaffed. Um, like I've I haven't met an IT organization yet which says that they have you know less things to do than they have people, right? Uh, and that's typically because there's insufficient automation in these. Um, in these departments, and the insufficient automation is, is a corollary to there being too much repetition. And the reason why there's so much repetition, so much stuff that, that's, um, that's so much redundant work is that there's a lack of standardization. You might, you're, operate, you're 
organization might be using lots of different operating systems, lots of different component stacks, and all those require special attention that takes a lot of time and agility away from your IT organization. So by, by using a cloud management framework, you allow, uh, you allow consolidating things around uh, more specific, um, you consolidating around a much more scalable process where you're talking about applications and stacks and not at the individual component layer. On, on top of that, when anything you start managing at scale um, takes up, uh, a lot of times it takes up a, more time per unit than what you originally started out at. So for, think of it this way. Um, think of a messy tool shed. Um, when you have a lot of stuff in your tool shed, it's going to take you a lot of time to find things. Whereas if you only have, if your tool shed only has two tools, a hammer and a screwdriver, it's very easy to find things. So as you get more and more tools, as, uh, as the amount of things that you have to manage increases, the, the time you have to spend organizing and keeping th things tidy increases. So a cloud management tool allows you to, uh, to keep things tidy so that in case of an emergency, you can find things quickly. If you, going back to the analogy, if, if your tool shed is, um, if it's messy and you need a hammer really quickly, it's going to take you forever to be able to find that. Um, by, by having a system that automatically organizes uh, your re cloud resources into logical groups that, uh, that relate to your applications, it's going to make, make things much easier to troubleshoot. Um, and of course, this, this problem gets even bigger as, uh, as you increase in, in size. Um, there's a the world of difference between having 10 tools, between having 100 tools, and then having you know, thousands of tools managed across you know, different teams that have access to different things, and, and each, tool, each tool shed you have might have different opening hours. Managing the, the complexity of something like that, which in the IT realm would be lots of teams, lots of applications, uh, with lots of permissions for each, that becomes very, very difficult. So cloud management tool allows you to operate efficiently at scale. Another big problem that you run into when you're, uh, when you're deploying on the cloud is the aspect of, of accounting for things, or, or basically costing. Um, when you get a bill for a million dollars from Amazon or from some service provider, you want to have some sort of visibility into who's using up the, those resources. So if, um, if your internal department, uh, say running CloudStack, uh, reports to you that you've been using, that this department has been using 80% of all of your cloud's uh, resources, you want to be able to have some sort of finer grain uh, visibility into how those resources are being used. Uh, it could be that it was some runaway process that you ended up uh, just spin, spinning up lots of servers, but it could be perfectly legitimate with, uh, with a, a breakdown that says that 20% has of those resources have gone towards R&D, 40% have gone into actual production usage, and the remaining 40% were uh, a combination of um, dev and test and, and perhaps a batch job or two being run. Lock-in is, uh, lock is another very, very big element. Migrating from one cloud to another is very expensive. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of friction involved in doing so. When, uh, when, you're moving from, uh, when you're moving resources from one area to another, it could be just, for example, from one the internal data center running CloudStack to one Amazon region, uh, you need to build into the application a lot of logic that allows you to, to freely move those workloads around. Um, there's tools like Chef and Puffet that allow, uh, that allow you to do this, but you need to think up, uh, up front about how to, uh, how to build your application so that you can move it around um, and, and take advantage of uh, better networks, lower costs, or, or what have you. So you need to think about that. You know, up front. Also, there are varying levels of lock-in. Lock-in can be either architectural, for example, you're using services that are internal, um, integration into an LDAP repository or um, 
some tying, tying into some internal services that can't be accessed from the public internet. Um, that's an architectural limitation, architectural lock-in. Um, and then there's also like a, a software licensing uh, lock-in, where you have software that uh, has both uh, permissive licenses, and that would be either proprietary software with unlimited licenses, or that would be open source. But you need to be very careful when you're building your applications as well, to make sure that the that uh, there you're not using restrictive uh, licenses that are restrictive. Meaning, if you need twice the capacity or ten times the capacity um, for a certain application because of some operation you're running, that your that your software licensing is not a, a problem to that. Uh, another a big problem that um, that enterprises and companies at scale run into when deploying on hybrid clouds is, is the, the question of permissions. Um, here's an example. Let's say that you have a contractor um, that has not been, that you bring on to, to help you patch some systems or help you, uh, you know, increase uh, efficiency at, on some things. Um, and he, that contractor hasn't been performing that well. Uh, so, of course, you, you lay him off. Well, you need to make sure that that contractor no longer has access to your systems. Um, for example, you might be able to revoke his access from uh, from your cloud by revoking uh, revoking those those access. But how do you know that he doesn't he didn't set a password on one of the servers, or how do you know that he's not taking away with him um, some SSH keys uh, that would allow him to to do uh, to seek revenge or something like that. Making sure that you have uh, a, a proper uh, policy for uh, allocating permissions and revoking per permissions is paramount. And more important as your team size and your project size increases. If it's just two people uh, running uh, an itty bitty project, permissions is not that much of an issue. But as you scale, as your organization grows, the likelihood of that happening increases. And, and that's to say nothing of laptops being stolen or uh, all sorts of different things that could be security threats. So uh, permissions is a, is a big issue as well. And then harking on, on the back of permission, there's also security. Um, one thing that enterprises run into is that there's a diffusion of responsibility over security. What that means is that if if person A launches a, a web, uh, like a, just a simple wiki for his internal use, um, the responsibility over maintaining that particular um, that that particular instance uh, of the wiki is kind of loose, right? It's um, it the security team doesn't. Like the security department doesn't necessarily know about this wiki, so it's hard for them to to guarantee security of it. But then the person who launched it, he doesn't know that much about security, and then after a while, he might, uh, as as long as the wiki is running, he might just not touch it anymore, meaning it's not being patched, which increases security risk. So just like there there might be um, some governance and some policies around patching software. Uh, using cloud management software allows uh, the security team to have visibility over all the applications that are currently running in the environment and seeing which ones have been patched, which ones have not. Um, and, and basically to uh, allow some sort of separ uh, separation of concerns, uh, but have clear responsibility over all the different roles. So, uh, so in the end, uh, with the cloud management system, your security team can have the, the, the visibility and the information they need about systems to be able to fill their, to, to fulfill their role. Um, and at the same time, you, um, your developers don't have to have that concern and can just focus on actually using. So it enables this self-service without the process of asking for permission from many different people. Um, another big win uh, in the cloud um, is, of course, the concept of operational agility. That is to be able to, uh, that is to, be able to do new things uh, with greater efficiency without ha having to worry that much about um, the, the legacy process that you had uh, and being able to uh, 
uh, to manage larger quantities of resources for, uh, for every unit of time that you have. Um, when you move to the cloud, when you move an application to the cloud, you want to make sure that um, then you're, you're not bringing along with you uh, everything that was slowing you down in, in traditional hosting. If you do that, then you won't be, you won't be successful. You want to make sure that you, you're, you're building systems that are both self-service, so that you, you know, when somebody needs something, they can provision it, and when they don't need it anymore, they can deprovision it, without having to go through the whole uh, procurement process. And just like CloudStack does this very, very well for individual servers and for individual resource components, uh, cloud management software allows you to ba basically create vending machines for the rest of the organization. So you might be able to create um, a sort of IT vending machine that offers wikis, that offers um, you know, ticketing systems, source code, uh, uh, version control repositories, all sorts of things, so that the, the management of those is still done by the IT department, but the usage and provisioning is done by the people who actually need it. So you have you get agility in in the separation of concerns. Uh, that also allows you to, to to separate all these different processes in in what makes sense. Uh, this is one of my favorite strips from uh, from Dilbert. So, uh, <laughs> and, and oftentimes it's actually very true. Um, Disaster recovery is never really thought about until it's too late. Um, it's never an urgent item until you're, there's actual damage caused by not having had a disaster recovery plan. So by having cloud management tools, it allows you to, to have uh, disaster recovery by default baked into um, the components that you use. Um, in my experience from, from before SCADA, I've seen that there's very, very insufficient disaster recovery in production environments. Um, the flow is usually something is, is uh, some sets of servers are in development, and then when they pass QA, they become promoted to, to, um, to production. And then from there on, people don't really want to touch it. People don't really want to shut down servers to see what happens, to see if the server gracefully recovers from it. People like... Um, rightly so become very uh, risk averse. And that's because traditionally it's not very easy to upfront create proper disaster recovery. With the cloud management system, it allows you to bake that into the individual components that are going to compose the services that your application is built on top of so that you have uh, disaster, like you have proper disaster recovery by default. Um, but one of the things, one thing that you need to be you need to be careful about is that data growth is an obstacle for uh, for disaster recovery. Um, one thing that I have observed, and, and it's been observed in the community at large, is that data grows mu data grows in volume much faster than bandwidth does, which means that it's taking longer and longer to move uh, data around. So you can kind of think of it as a hard drive as a tape now, where um, it's taking longer and longer to take that the data that's to, to move all the data that's on a hard drive off to something else, um, and it's just, you're seeing the same thing in at the individual cloud where the uh, where the amount of uh, bandwidth you have from say Amazon to your data center is is not grow that bandwidth is not growing at the same rate as uh, as the amount of data that you're gathering is growing, which means that it's it's uh, you have some sort of concept of data gravity that prevents you from from very large scale disaster recovery, which means that you you want to have incremental data backups. Um, so in in this case, uh, for say a, a traditional MySQL database, you want to have in, in the, the baked in disaster recovery that I'm talking about would be to have a uh, a hot slave running in, uh, in on Amazon, for example, uh, with the rest of your MySQL production cluster being inside of CloudStack with the rest of your application servers so that if your internal data center goes down or if something happens to it, you, you need to shut down everything for a certain job that's running for the financial, for the financial departments, then uh, you, you're still able to have a up-to-date copy of all your data 
running on the on Amazon so that you can move the rest of your non-state sensitive servers to Amazon and, and host your workload, host your application there on a temporary basis before you move everything back in-house. So um, disaster recovery is actually very tricky. Um, and it gets uh, it gets more and more difficult when you start having um, like data retention policies or uh, or uh, selective log se selective data retention and things like that. That makes it very difficult for you to have the same policy that applies both to where you traditionally operate so in your production environment, be it on Amazon, be it on on CloudStack, and to have that same uh, operate uh, that say, same policy apply to whatever wherever your disaster recovery environment is. So cloud management tools allow you help you to do this. Visualizing uh, your infrastructure is actually very very important too. Um, an individual developer or an individual team might have a visibility into their application, but the IT department needs to have some sort of visibility into at scale, how are things performing? So being able to uh, to aggregate data and to report that data, not on an application basis, but on a whole department basis or a whole cloud basis, allows you to spot and troubleshoot problems um, very, very easily. So just like you know, when you're connecting or when you're at home and you're browsing internet and suddenly you can't connect to a site, um, it's, it's it's very difficult to determine whether the internet connection dropped for you or whether it's for everybody else. When, when your IT department has visibility over lots of different applications, it, it will have information about whether the, uh, you'll have information about whether an individual application is down because of something related to that application or whether it's a systemic failure, um, for example, some uh, some network congestion that's that's causing components to fail over um, one by one. So when you, it's kind of like when you're looking at an individual ant, you, you can be misled into thinking that the ant, whole ant col colony is is done. But when you aggregate and report things at scale, then you you get a lot more information, um, and and you get you'll be able to determine with better accuracy whether you should be provisioning new capacity and adding that to CloudStack or not. So uh, one of the challenges is insufficient aggregation and reporting at scale, um, and and having that, that properly broken down by teams, by organizations, by um, by all these different uh, units that will allow you to, to forecast this better. And then, of course, um, one thing that's actually really really critical. Um, is collaborating, um, just like you, uh, software developers collaborate around code, you need to have uh, your system admins uh, collaborate over your infrastructure as well. Uh, if some, uh, if system admin Bob made a change to, uh, to uh, your MySQL configuration, it's very important that, um, that Joe knows about this. Um, so, uh, so having information being, um, propagated between everybody working on infrastructure is critical. Um, you don't want to have Bob make a change and then Joe wonder why CPU load suddenly went down for no apparent reason. Um, you want to have you, you want to have that information uh, propagate. Um, and so so cloud management tools allow you to track changes done on infrastructure and help help your assistant means, uh, and DevOps people um, manage and, and uh, track whatever changes that they're, they're doing on, on your, your infrastructure. So in case uh, you start troubleshooting, when you, you observe increased error rates, you can map that to changes in, in your source code and, for example, new application version. But you can also map that to uh, configuration changes at the infrastructure level or um, changes in instance sizes or something like that. For example, you might uh, determine that you need to uh, change to an instance flavor that has less RAM but more CPU proportionally, um, and then you, uh, you know, because on, on the previous analysis you determined that you're running constantly running out of CPU but not of memory, and then when you've made that change, 
uh, you might run into you know out of uh, out of RAM memory uh, out of uh, RAM mess, uh, errors that then trigger something else that increases the error rates and being able to map all those different items uh, and track all that is very very useful for troubleshooting things. Now, um, the, the, one of the last things I want to touch, about, uh, touch upon is the different cloud patterns that we've observed uh, at Scalar um, uh, on, on hybrid clouds. Uh, one thing that we really haven't seen uh, actually been successful is cloud bursting. Um, in, the, uh, in the press, people very often talk about cloud bursting, uh, but it turns out that cloud bursting is very difficult because of um, because of those the the data requirements that I was talking about, you can't just put application servers. Um, let's say you have a web app, and that web app has you know, ten times more traffic during launch day than during the rest. You can't just add another application server um, on in, in cloud burst to Amazon because that application server still needs to um, it's it still needs to make requests to the database, and suddenly the latency between Amazon and your database on CloudStack. Uh, is much higher, meaning you're, you're you cloud bursted, but you just you know, decreased and, and ruined your customer experience. So cloud bursting isn't has not been that successful, uh, from what we've seen. But there's there's three uh, three applications, there's three usage three usages of um, uh, hybrid clouds that actually are very very useful. And the first one is developing in the public cloud and then moving things in production in-house when, th when things have been fully tested. Um, so just like I was talking about how important it is to move to a self-service model, um, if your software developers can very easily provision the resources and prototype everything in the, pro in the public cloud without having to deal with the corporate firewall and without having all these stringent security requirements that production applications have, it allows them to to fail very rapidly and, and to, uh, to fix whatever failures that they detect very rapidly. So they allow them to iterate very quickly uh, without having that, without being slowed down with, with all the, the traditional process that, that they have. So, um, so in this case here, you have developer Joe that, that um, built an application with his team and he just wants to, to host it somewhere to, to show it to some, to some folks. Um, in this case here, he'll, uh, he'll just prototype that, uh, and a cloud management solution allows you to do this very well, prototype that on Amazon and then make sure that all the architecture is done the way you want. And then when things are ready to go in production, then you just reuse that exact model and you deploy that on CloudStack. Um, and then now uh, the, your corporate security team can, can then apply whatever rules that they want on top of it and they can provide for the security of it. So that's the first, uh, first type of uh, hybrid cloud that we've seen being very successful. Um, the second type is, uh, is in having hybrid, hybrid application components. Uh, an example of that would be a large uh, enterprise application that has uh, lots of different components, lots of different services that are provided to uh, other pieces. Uh, you might have uh, a Cassandra database running in-house um, that, um, that is feeding data to uh, a message queue, and then you might have a, a web and some web and application servers in the mix. Um, but, then, uh, all, you know, but then you might want to have, um, and these are all for, for, for consistent workloads. Uh, but then you, you might have uh, inconsistent workloads, for example, batch processing. And rather than putting that uh, internally, rather than running that uh, in your, on, on the cloud stack in your own data center, you will, might want to use the elasticity of a public cloud for that batch processing. So you might have um, an application component that's running in the cl public cloud, whereas all the other components of your application are, are running in-house. So in this case, this is a hybrid cloud where some application components are on Amazon, some of them might be on XSpace Cloud, and then some, some, might be, uh, uh, some might be on CloudStack in your data center. And to determine where, which application components need to be where uh, is just a pure function of the, the specs that the cloud offers. 
Um, so that's a, a second type of application uh, of hybrid cloud that we've seen being very successful. Um, and the third one that I briefly touched upon is um, having um, using a public cloud for disaster recovery. Uh, for example, having a hot, uh, MySQL hot slave running uh, on Amazon so that if everything fails, you can still uh, move every, move all your uh, move your workloads, move your applications to the cloud until connectivity is restored um, in your data center. Um, facilitated, of course, by by any cloud, any decent cloud management solution. Um, and that's something that we've seen being done very well, um, especially when uh, when the disaster recovery has been baked into the individual components that are being used. For example. Uh, you you might want to have uh, automatic failover for MySQL that's baked into the MySQL components rather than uh, than having that logic being custom built by software engineers uh, for each individual project that's being worked on. So having these blocks that are higher level again. Uh, so those are the three types of hybrid clouds that we have observed being uh, being used on CloudStack and Amazon today uh, on uh, managed by Scalar. Um, all of the, in, in terms of percentages, uh, this represents about 50% uh, of these use cases are disaster recovery, and the rest is perhaps 25 and 25% with equal parts uh, developments in public cloud and then having application components uh, that, are, that are elsewhere. So if you, um, we can now move on to, to the questions. We have about five to 10 minutes for questions. You can reach me at Sebastian Stadel on Twitter, or you could just shoot me an email at Sebastian at uh, and I'll be happy to, uh, to forward you to one of our technical engineers to uh, answer any, any architectural questions you might have about hybrid clouds, uh, or just get a proof of concept going. Uh, so um, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, for the presentation, Gerilyn, do you want to? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, we, we yeah we have a couple of questions. Um, the f the first one, and this is the the burning question um, mm -hmm. for the audience, is um, was that a picture of your shed because it was incredibly organized? <laughs> uh, no, just uh, it's it actually most of the slides uh, I didn't attribute it to anything, but uh, they were just taken off Google Images. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So well, that, yeah, I wish my tool shed was like that. Because <laughs> somebody wanted you to come over and organize their their tool shed. <laughs> um, so for for the real questions, um, can you explain the difference between enterprise and open source scalar versions? Um, so there's uh, there's actually it's like CloudStack uh, right now. Um, there is absolutely no difference between the enterprise. The enterprise edition is basically uh, getting a support contract uh, for for open source scalar. Just like right now, if you deploy um, CloudStack, uh, you get it under the Apache license, but then you might want to go to Citrix for a support contract. That's exactly how it works with scalar. Okay, thanks. So, second question is: um, so, you know, talk a little more about why cloud bursting is not successful. Um, cloud bursting hasn't been so again um, it, it really harks back to this idea of data gravity um, data has been growing at a mass, much faster rate than uh, than bandwidth and that makes it very difficult for um, for cloud bursting um, for example if your application needs to make 10 requests to the database to various components various services to be able to render a page and show that to um, to a web uh, web user or to generate a report, um, then those uh, if those ten requests are serial, then uh, then any increase in latency between the application server that's generating that and the backend services that are required for for sending uh, for sending that request, um, all all those all that time just uh, just ends up piling piling up and the total generation time increases dramatically. To get around that, you need to be using either uh, a, a, a new generation of database tools. For example, we've seen people being successful with that with Cassandra. Um, we've seen people be successful with, um, uh, what's it called, uh, Hive and, and the, Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop stack, um, and as well as Mongo. Um, these allow you to have um, 
to have your cluster being fully redundant on both sides of the cloud so that when you actually do need to cloud burst, your data is already out there uh, ready, to, ready to be accessed uh, very rapidly. The problem with doing that is that it's very, very costly in, in terms of maintaining exact replica of, um, of your configuration on both sides, both on Amazon and on CloudStack. Um, and it's very costly in terms of uh, network bandwidth as well. Um, think of it this way: If you're writing um, 10 gigabytes worth of uh, 10 gigabytes worth of logs uh, every hour, then you need uh, you need a very very fat pipe to the internet to be able to to send all those 10 gigs per hour to uh, to your Cassandra cluster, so that you can still generate all these reports, still run all that big data, even when one of the one of the sides of of the hybrid cloud is is down. So hybrid clouds are actually very very challenging to build. And they require a lot of architectural, um, upfront architectural decisions. Um, if if uh, the person who asked the question, if they can just shoot me an email at sebastian.scaler.com, I'll be happy to uh, to uh, to link them link to some resources online that that will help them determine how to properly cloud burst. Uh, or I could just uh, introduce to some of our technical engineers here that, that have uh, done this before uh, many times. But the reason that we see that hybrid clouds, uh, that uh, cloud bursting uh, typically fails is because there is insufficient understanding of all the, diff the constraints of the constraints and availability uh, of all the different comp the components that service a single application. Great, great, thank you. Um, so, question for you, um, going back to the open source versus enterprise, um, can you just comment on the release cycle between the two? Are, are, is it the same release cycle? How are they kind of, how do they sync up? Um, we have a release every 45 days. That's, um, that's plus minus a week, depending on uh, the feedback that we get from the uh, uh, from early beta testers uh, and from um, uh, from the open source community, so we we have uh, our codes on GitHub, uh, GitHub.com/scalar/scalar, uh, and that the code there is 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 put that out there on a regular basis. Uh, but then we also have stable builds. So and those stable builds are uh, you could just Google for open source uh, scalar download, and then there's a scalar.net page that that has the link to that. Um, those stable downloads, um, those packages are made available on a 45-day basis. The rest of the code is updated continuously. So if you if you just want to play around with things, you could either uh, use a get a free trial on uh, hosted scaler at scaler.net, um, uh, or if you want to just deploy it and use it um, yourselves and deploy it internally. That, uh, then we recommend that you get a stable package. The, uh, the continuously updated code um, is mostly for development purposes, for the community to be able to, to see what direction we're going in, contribute patches, um, and all, all that community management. Great, thanks. Um, a question about the interface. What does the interface look like? If we wanted to see a demo of the interface, where would we go? Um, actually, I might be able to spin that up very quickly. Uh, can you confirm that you're, you see Firefox right now? Uh, sorry, Chrome? Yeah, we do. All right. So, um, so I, I'm loading up Scalar here. Um, uh, what, what we see right now is the... Um, uh, is the scalar dashboard um, that allows you to it, it based on widgets uh, these widgets allow you to customize uh, what you want uh, to see on a, uh, uh, to have an overview of your infrastructure uh, in my case here um, I wanted to have an overview of how much uh, our marketing team here is spending on uh, on demos marketing and sales team is spending on demos um, so you can see here that this month we have lots of farms that cost uh, upwards you know, little about one one dollar for each fund, um, and then I also have here a widget that shows um, like health status for for Amazon itself. Uh, but that would be expanded for every cloud that I might use. 
Um, and then uh, you um, here, I'll just uh, go ahead and create a farm. Uh, so a, a, a cluster to show how um, um, what the process is to build a new farm. So let's say that we want to build a a, a simple uh, a simple web application that has a that has a MySQL on it. There we go. Um, and then we might want to have Apache as well. So let's add Apache. In front of that, we want a load balancer. And let's say that we also want RabbitMQ in the mix here. So we're going to add it here. There we go. So this is all, all that's required to create a new uh, application based on uh, that uses those, those components. Now you can click on each individual one here um, and then set whatever settings you, you want. For example, um, Right on RabbitMQ, you might want to have a ratio of disk nodes to RAM nodes of 10%. Uh, your, your storage engine, the only one available here is, is EBS, uh, but on MySQL, you might want to have a sorted volume that's based on RAID arrays. Uh, in, in this case here, you might want to have RAID 5 that's done over maybe five EBS volumes, and each volume is um, of 10, uh, 10 gigabytes in size. Uh, so this allows you to define exactly what you want your infrastructure to look like, with these um, based on these very easy this very easy uh, web interface, um, and then you can enable scaling based on load average or any other metric that you want. Uh, you can also have a combination of metrics um, by adding you know, new metrics, and then it just uses the first. And if the first doesn't determine, if the first metric doesn't warrant scaling, then you'll, you fall back to the second one. Um, and this is basically the interface for creating a new farm. When, once you've done that, you hit save, and then you can launch it. Uh, here I added everything on EC2, but um, it'd be very easy to add a component um, that would be running uh, on CloudStack. There we go. Great. Thanks for the demo. Um, and then one clarification, um, kind of to your last point. Um, the value proposition of Scalar, in addition to to CloudStack. Could you speak about that? The question came in as, you know, they both seem to be applications that let you do some level of cloud management. Um, so CloudStack is actually management of the cloud itself uh, in terms of the resources that the cloud has. Um, cloud management software and, and scalers specifically allow me to manage the applications that are running on top of the cloud, uh, of that cloud allow you to manage the permissions that your users have over those resources, allow you to have um, control over um, like your, uh, for example, Team A might have a maximum budget of $20,000 worth of spend every month. Um, and then that would be defined as a combination of uh, Amazon spend, uh, of CloudStack spend, and as defined by the IT department. Um, and the management of the applications, that's what cloud management does. That, that's what Scalar does. The, the management of the, the cloud itself as the physical resources, um, so API and below, um, that's what CloudStack does. Does that answer the question? Um, it appears to. I'm not seeing a follow-up. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Sebastian, that's... Um, that's uh, great that you did a demo. We got a lot of compliments on the demo, um, so thanks for being willing to kind of just jump in and do that um, ad hoc. Um, thank you for your great presentation mm -hmm. today. Um, folks, you have uh, Sebastian's follow-up in information in case you want to reach out to him with additional questions that you didn't have a, uh, the opportunity to ask. Um, so with that, we are going to launch right into our next session. Um, I will um, go ahead yeah, just and... So let... go ahead. Just a one last comment. Uh, Jalen, I'd like to thank you and uh, everybody on the CloudStack team for building some such awesome software. Um, at Scalar, we really love you guys.